we had a good time. It gave us a chance to review our procedures and uh, just hone ourselves to that razor edge. Claude uh, designed our patch here, and uh, we're very proud of that patch. It looks very much like Hubble does up in orbit. Launch morning, one of the first things we have to do is get in those orange pumpkin suits. You can tell Scott's pretty nervous being the rookie here. <laughs> but uh, everybody's pretty excited. We've been in quarantine, like I said, a few more days, and uh, Steve's ready to go. And uh, Billy Bob, you know, he, he's pretty tense, and uh, he's thinking about that Canadian arm to fly it around. John's ready. What we're doing here is actually doing some pressure checks on the suit, make sure the integrity of the suit. Mike's ready to go, and he's uh, never without a loss of words. <laughs> and good old Claude, and obviously he couldn't be here with us tonight. Well, we left the quarantine facility on the way out to the pad. Notice the sun's out, the weather's good, and we're ready to go. The folks at USA and Mission Control had checked out Discovery, and uh, it's in perfect condition, so we're ready. Here we are uh, exiting on the 195-foot level of the launch pad prior to manning up. Another uh, beautiful view of Discovery. Here's Kurt uh, strapping into the vehicle. As you can see, we are uh, in the vertical, and that's easy to tell here. Here's myself uh, getting ready to go in the orbiter in, in what's called the white room. And Jean-Francois uh, getting into his seat. Uh, John Grunsfeld's to his right. Another uh, beautiful night view. Obviously, we manned up during the day. Here is uh, two minutes. Prior to launch, you can see the beanie cap coming off the uh, top of the external tank. About six seconds prior to liftoff, the main engine's light, and when the computers check them out and see that everything's okay, the solid rocket motors are ignited. Here's the view inside the cockpit at SRB ignition, and you can see a lot of shaking going on. Looks a little bit slow uh, coming off the pad, but there's nothing slow about it. The things that come to my mind are power and speed. Here's a uh, beautiful view of the orbiter. You can see here it gets pretty hot down at the bottom of the external tank, but the insulation does a really good job. About uh, two minutes after liftoff, the solid rocket motors come off. Here's a, uh, obviously an external view, and the next view is from inside the, uh, the cockpit, and you can see it's very, very bright. It's the first time I looked out the window during the ascent. It really got my attention. Here's the view from uh, the other solid rocket motor. Certainly a spectacular view, but not something we could see from the cockpit. Once the solids come off, it takes about another six minutes to get into orbit. Here we are at zero G. I didn't believe it, so Kurt had to tell me. <laughs> and once we get into space, we uh, have to convert our rocket ship into a spaceship. One of the first things we do is open the payload bay doors. Here's some uh, jet firings. And you can see the ice that uh, followed us into space from the cold cryogenic propellants. The second day on orbit is dedicated to checking out all the main equipments we'll use for rendezvous, which are the arm. You see here that's uh, the RMS robotic manipulator system, can Canadian built uh, robotic arm. And you see the snares that will be used to grapple the telescope. And here Steve is checking out the, the suits with the other EVA crew members before going uh, EVA uh, two days after. Well, the, uh, the most important event of this whole flight was the rendezvous, obviously, because without the rendezvous, we couldn't do the EVA. Anyway, that's from a pilot standpoint. So we started the rendezvous from uh, the ground, actually, when we launched. We were launching into position to rendezvous with the Hubble telescope. We did a few more burns uh, the day before the actual rendezvous, and then on rendezvous day, we did a few more. And uh, the, the first good glimpse we got of Hubble was beautiful. She was in a little bit different attitude than uh, we had planned, and our trainers had trained us well to, uh, to capture it. When the telescope is very stable, uh, the arm uh, is moving. As you can see, I use this target on top to stabilize the end effector, and the snares that you saw earlier in the movie are uh, snaring that uh, grapple pin and then uh, do a firm attachment to the telescope. And the next scene uh, is the berthing of the telescope. Well, it was a great relief to finally have Hubble in the payload bay and to get ready for the uh, spacewalks. John and I, about an hour after waking up that third day, got our suits on. We'd end up having the suits on for about a total of 10 hours. Here we are setting up the, uh, for the first EVA. You can see Hubble in the background. That's John in the foreground getting the tools set up. Uh, our first task, as Kurt said, was the gyroscope replacements. The uh, aft shroud doors are open and inside are the three small boxes that contain a total of six gyroscopes. One of the things you want to notice during the EVAs is sometimes they're occurring in the bright sunlight like this, but then you'll also see scenes that are in the very dark uh, nighttime passes. 
And you can imagine going to work and having 45 minutes of light and then 45 minutes of day and then 45 minutes of night and 45 minutes of day. It's a strange um, work environment. The suits weigh 300 pounds on Earth and, of course, in space they don't weigh anything. So it's really a pleasure to work on them in space because on Earth, every time you have them on, you're actually supported by a crane. Here we are actually inside the telescope replacing the gyroscopes. Again, it's three small boxes. We used uh, both power tools and manual tools. Every time we held onto a box or a tool, we had to have it tethered to ourselves so that if it came out of our hands, it didn't float away. The EVA lasted about eight hours and 15 minutes. Uh, John and I had cross-trained to do each other's tasks in case we were called to do that, and at the end of the EVA, we actually did end up doing that. After the gyroscopes were installed, we closed the aft shroud doors and went to work on the voltage improvement kits in the front of the telescope. Here's John opening that door. And I was on the back of the telescope placing some handrail covers on some handrails that uh, had some degraded paint on them. After Steve and John had done such a fantastic job basically putting the uh, telescope to rights, and uh, they could easily have let go of the telescope uh, after that, and it would have served us well. They then, r the program risked having Claude and myself go out and uh, change out the computer. And here you see me uh, opening the bay, not nervously, of course. Actually, I was just checking that the uh, door stay was free. Opened up the door and pulled out the old um, 386 with coprocessor and uh, installed the um, a 486 which is basically uh, a pretty souped up computer that can handle all the radiation that the Hubble sees while it's uh, in orbit at 360 miles. That took us about uh, two hours and uh, Claude assisted me there. Here you see me installing some insulation onto the uh, outside of that computer bay. The uh, new computer uses a lot less heat, uh, uses a lot less energy and produces a lot less heat and as a result the um, computer needs more insulation to keep it warm against the cold night. Having finished that task, it became uh, Claude's um, job to change out the fine guidance sensor. This is a, like a small baby piano-sized box, weighs about 300 pounds. And uh, here he's installed a handle onto it so he can pull it out of the telescope. It's what's called an axial instrument and um, has a mirror at the end of it that intercepts the light coming into the telescope uh, down the axis. Once uh, we'd extracted the the box with a little difficulty um, in your. We uh, installed it on uh, a temporary handhold, as Kirk put it, like a gun rack on the port side of the shuttle. And then with that stored, as you can see in the right hand side of the screen there, we uh, pulled out a new FGS, which uh, Claude is slowly pulling up out of the bay, straight up. And then I get on the uh, left hand side here and just basically pull off a mirror cover that covers the very uh, fragile but clean mirror that's going to receive the telescope's light and we slide it in. About this point we had some difficulty inserting it and uh, it, it was when we had it kind of halfway uh, in, halfway out. About that time uh, Claude had a carbon dioxide sensor, a false one I should say, message which made us wonder what we were going to do next. Um, but luckily we quickly ascertained that as to being a false alarm and carried on. Well, with two EVAs on our belt, we did get a little chance to look out the window. Here we are flying over Merritt Island and the Kennedy Space Center where we launched from. You can see the runway. Day three, we set out uh, to take care of some uh, rewiring of a box that helps the fine guidance sensor do its job. These are new, improved fine guidance sensors and can not only help point the telescope but also to do science in themselves. They're scientific instruments. So Steve and I went back to rewire the optical control electronics and when we do these tasks uh, high up on Hubble, we're very close to the solar rays, so it's kind of a touchy time. And Mike, as the Ivy intervehicular crew member directing the whole scene, kept reminding me, don't lean back and watch out for the solar rays. Next, we were off to uh, Bay 5 to replace the S-band uh, single axis transmitter. This is one of the two transmitters where all the science and engineering data come through. And we had a lot of very fine tasks with uh, using just our fingers on connectors, which are aptly named sub-miniature assembly connectors. And uh, they're really tiny. They're smaller than what you have coaxial connectors on the back of the TV. And along with Goddard, we developed some special tools to be able to do that. So here you see a little torque wrench. After that, we went about the task of improving some of the thermal insulation, as Mike and Claude had done on the first day on the bays, uh, after which uh, another seven and a half hour EVA, close to eight hours, we had a chance to wish everybody a Merry Christmas, since this was Christmas Eve. And uh, unfortunately, Kurt had to 
order us back in. We wanted to stay out, of course, but uh, he doesn't have a button to reel us in, so we came in. With the uh, EVAs complete, it was time to send the newly repaired Hubble uh, telescope back to science and back to the scientists on the ground. It takes a lot of uh, coordination to deploy the telescope. Uh, it takes not only all the crew members uh, that are on the flight, but many, many people on the ground. I like this view. You can see how bright the sun is uh, coming through the uh, windows of the orbiter. We want you to notice their shirts. They're pretty awesome. <laughs> Here's uh, Jean-Francois holding the telescope out over the payload bay. He's going to release the uh, robot arm. And once the robot arm is clear of the telescope, and this is actually in uh, in a uh, not sped up uh, video, so the arm, arm actually moves really quick. And then we fire the forward jets of the RCS, and the telescope quickly passes over our heads. And it's uh, really an impressive sight. It uh, almost makes you want to duck while you're in the cockpit. And it's hard to tell here, but the telescope is rapidly uh, proceeding away from the orbiter. You can see the uh, aperture door open on the telescope. Here we are getting some uh, good pictures of Hubble. You can also see the uh, high gain antennas deployed. And uh, over the next several hours and the next several days, the telescope gets further and further away from us. We had a special visitor on that Christmas. Once the telescope was uh, finally repaired and gone, we could have a little bit of fun. Here's uh, the commander spinning up the pilot. <laughs> Obviously, we have to do uh, normal hygiene type things in space. And also, we get to talk to our, our friends and family at home. Here's Mike doing some email. Yes, we do get email with our friends and uh, families at home. Here's a uh, housekeeping task gone wrong. Of course, we're trying to keep all those batteries uh, for return to Earth. Um, one of the difficulties I think that Kerr has to go through is see his beautiful spaceship after liftoff get turned into um, a motorhome gone wrong. <laughs> um, basically, with all the pieces of equipment and the stuff on the mid deck that we get out um, for the EVAs, it, it really kind of tears apart the uh, orderliness of the orbit, and we have to get that all back together. Here you see us stowing equipment, getting the suits back into uh, bags, all the extra equipment stowed away, and all the C-300 tools and get to the point where we can close up the uh, pedal bay doors with ourselves already in orange suits, getting ready for the onset of G's. Basically, Kurt uh, does a, a burn that high up and brings us down into the atmosphere. And uh, here you see us waiting for free fall um, and then entry interface when the G's start to come on. We had a, a mini cam camera that allowed us to take views inside the cabin during the entry phase as well as a view to the HUD. And here you see the G's coming on. Well, the folks at Mission Control say it was time to come home and uh, complete our Christmas adventure. Uh, this is a view from the thermal camera on the ground as the shuttle approaches the Kennedy Space Center. Now looking through the heads-up display, which uh, Scott and I have in front of us to help land the shuttle, you can see the rectangle. That's where the shuttle thinks the runaway is, but it's still pretty dark. So we, uh, we're not sure exactly where the runaway is yet. Uh, we're passing about 9,000 feet, 300 knots, and uh, another thermal image here as we get down to the pre-flare. Scott's going to put the gear down at 300 feet above the ground, and uh, we'll cross the threshold, and you can see the two little bright lights. Those are the lights to light up the runway since the orbiter does not have any landing lights, and we'll just come on in here and, uh, and do a night landing. We've only done about 13 of those in the shuttle program. I think this was number 13, and we'll go to the outside just to give you an idea of what the view is. With the orbiter safely on the ground, Scott puts out the drag chute uh, that helps slow us down and also some of the derotation forces on the nose gear, and we slowly start derotating. Again, on the right side, you can see the runway centerline lights, and here's a view back through the HUD again on the centerline lights. At about 60, uh, 70 miles an hour or so, Scott jettisons the chute. We roll to a stop. The orbiter has been absolutely perfect on the mission. We completed uh, all the tasks that was asked of us, even two days, with a, even a two-day shortened shorten mission. We uh, did the uh, ground steps to safety orbiter. We got off the orbiter into the crew transport vehicle and then had a chance to come out and work, walk around the orbiter. A truly, um, just like the Hubble telescope, a truly impressive piece of machinery. And uh, that completed our, uh, our Christmas adventure. <laughs>